Arizona homebuyers get a one-two punch from the state and from the feds. Today on the Unnamed Real Estate Podcast. Hi there. My name is Charles Ray Dawson. I'm the Associate Broker, Residential Sales Manager of ProStar Realty. This is the Unnamed Real Estate Podcast, episode 163. So this is this is going to be a fun one. So I'm <clears throat> wrapping, get my numbers going, going, get my Crawford report numbers going, and they happen to have this just one of those postings that oh my god, I could talk all day long about this thing, and like this is really what I want to talk about. Um, gentleman is talking about how home purchasing and selling happens in the uh, United Kingdom which for you Americans is England proper, Wales, and Scotland, North Ireland. And it's, okay, it's England. They're a little weird over there. Britain, United Kingdom. Those are not all the same thing. All right, anyways, long story short. And just how they transact real estate. That's what I love to talk about. Unfortunately, we got... We got news. We got all sorts of news. Um, and as a lot of my listeners and viewers and fans have sent me the same CNN news article starting like Friday. And my agents were calling me up asking about said CNN article. My broker was talking to me about said CNN article and what happened with NAR on Friday. We will definitely be getting to that. Now, what my original thought was, was actually before that because... We had a little bit of kerfuffle here in the state of Arizona where Congress got to the state, House and Senate got together, had a joint partisan bill. Everybody's agreed it was kumbaya. We finally done something, reaching hands across the aisle, and Katie Hobbs off the top rope. Bam! No, we don't get to do that. So we'll talk about that too. So, going to have a really fun. Oh, and one other thing. I was. I thought it was a joke, but no, we now have a swear jar here at ProStar Realty because apparently some people you can think you can work in real estate without swearing. I have my suspicions of who the suspect is, and since that suspect is one of the number one reasons why I swear, I am wondering if I'm not in some sort of weird sort of, what's that legal term, entrapment here. If you're the reason why I swear, do you get to complain about me expressing my feelings that are being felt because of your activity? Don't know. That's just weird thought, but I got a good Facebook post out of it the other day. It's like, I do not think it is financially viable for me to work at ProStar anymore, or at least come into the office if I have to be around these people. Not that I don't love my agents. All right. But it's a tough love. It's like the love a drill instructor has for his recruits, those slimy little amphibious spawn maggots who may one day achieve the title marine. But until then, they're just little piles of amphibious shit. Bing. Now, notice there's only one word I can't say. All right. And if I had a producer, what I'd be doing is I'd have the producer watch this entire video and edit like a little number down in the bottom. So every time I use a particular word, I'm not supposed to say, all right, that number counter would go up and then I donate like, per, you know, amount of money on that. So if you, the audience can keep count, maybe mention in the show notes below how often I say a certain word. Okay. Which is one of the most perfect words in the English language because it can be both a verb, a noun, an adjective, an adverb, you know, I think you can use it as a preposition. I can definitely use it as a proposition. All right. So that word, we all know that word. So yeah, like I said, keep count for you guys. Get the little counter up there. This is going to be fun. So let's start with the numbers first, because I do know that I won't swear during the numbers. I very rarely do. So anyways, the numbers for March 20th, 2024, actives this week were 16,679, which is up 74 from the week before. Our new listings were 2,219, down 31. Contracts were 2,614, up 109. And closings last week were six. 100, 1,622, right? And coming soon to an MLS near you is 772 new listings. 
All right, for you guys who can do math in the audience, what is going on here? Why do we have more active listings with less new listings coming on board, but our contracts went up at the same time? Remember, I do not show back on markets on this, and that's definitely what was pulling this whole thing over. All right, so it's your back on markets that, that rose that up a 74. And it we have like 80 or something new back on markets than we did the week prior. Interesting. Let's keep an eye on that. All right. For our Cromford report uh, numbers, everything moved up a little bit except for the Cromford score itself. Um, supply is at 69.7. So we got more supply. Our demand or buyers out there at 79.8, also moving up. But because those numbers, you know, supply moved up faster than demand, our Cromford report number came down to 114.4, which is one point less than it was last week. Right, so getting to alpha on that. Now, from our areas, let's take a look. We still got Chandler up at the top of the pack, up four month over month. They're at a 207.4. And then as we go down the thing, Glendale's losing, Gilbert's losing, Fountain Hills is losing, all but though they're still in the seller's market. Mesa, Phoenix, Avondale, Tempe, all still rising month over month. Although, Phoenix, can we really say that's a rise? Right. It's shown a 0% change on there, but that's just because statistically 149.2 up to 149.7 does not even cr crack over the 1% change model. All right. Going on down, okay, we got Scottsdale, Peoria, Cave Creek, Surprise, Paradise Valley all dropping down. Par Surprise also being in that weird little, they used to be 93.8, now they're 93.7, so it will show a zero on there. Continuing on down the line, we got Queen Creek going up. Goodyear down, Maricopa up, Buckeye down. Where are the buyer's deals at there? Queen Creek, Goodyear, Maricopa, and Buckeye. And if you are a seller, you want to be in that top five. Mesa, Fountain Hills, Gilbert, Glendale, and Chandler. All right. Now, let's get started. <clears throat> Last week, there was a great little article, and I literally discovered this thing when I read the editorial that was placed out there by representatives uh, Leo Bascolucci and Annalise, I want to say Ortiz, one of the nasty things when I print this thing, it all covers up. And they were explaining why they believe, you know, the Arizona Starter Homes Act was a good idea. What the elements of the Starter Homes Act was is that they were going to come in and legislate restrictions on municipalities on zoning All right wasn't any extra money paid okay but what it was going to do is that if you subdivided a piece of property All right take a piece of paper let's say this is your lot nice big lot and you're going to subdivide it into four parcels All right. see what you just did there so now we got one two three four all right. Municipalities would have a restriction that says, hey, you know what? Every parcel has to be a certain size. You can't just do that and sell this little parcel right here all right, and build a house on it. So what this, what this legislation did is says that you could subdivide down to 1,500 square feet. A lot of people are thinking, wait, my house is 2,400 square feet. How would I fit in a 1,500 square feet? Well, you don't, right? But a first-time home buyer would, or a couple who are newlyweds, so they don't need a lot of space because they still like each other. Right? They can get along in a 1,500 square foot lot. Right? No backyard, no front yard. Very, very small starter homes. You guys might remember an episode about six months or so ago where I was showing you that community that they have going in um, Austin. I want to say it was somewhere in Texas. Little itty bitty houses four 600 square foot houses on little itty bitty lots that's the kind of housing that this bill was going to bring to pass other thing that you could do a lot of those goofy little infill lots that you would see like in phoenix i can think of three of them off the top of my head little itty bitty lots but they're under four thousand square feet you cannot put a house in there remember a couple of years ago when the micro house trend was all the rage and all the hipsters wanted to live in a shipping container you could take one of these little lots drop a shipping container on there do some plumbing and electrical work and you would have a one bedroom house for somebody a first time home buyer getting on the escalator all right so in the interest of everything reducing housing costs 
helping low-income people find more housing. Everything to address this problem, both Republicans and Democrats, get together, all right, and hammer out a solution. And it passes both st state house, state senate. It goes to the governor for a signature, and Katie Hobbs kills it dead. And I'm yet to hearing a coherent word out of her mouth why she decided to do this. Now, Katie Hobbs, I got a love-hate relationship for her. I did not vote for her, okay? I did not vote for her because for some reason she did not feel the need to speak in public. She was pulling one of those, I don't have to campaign. I will just have my minion say, I'm not that person. Vote for me. I will save you from that person. Does this sound like a, a reoccurring theme in modern politics? So she stays in her basement. I think she did one debate, one public speaking. She was like a PBS. She goes out there. She's got this squeaky from on helium voice. Like, me, 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 me. You know, like beaker. All right. I, and next thing you know, my eyes are bleeding. My ears are bleeding and I'm convulsing in the corner. Her, her fingers are, her voice is just fingernails on a chalkboard. All right. But she's decided she wants, you know, but hey, she's done some things I approve. A couple previous episodes, you know, it's like, hey, Katie Hobbs, good job. You know, you know, you do good. I say you do good. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. You do bad. I'm coming for you. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. But in this particular case, she decides she's going to veto this. And her excuse for why she vetoed this is not, doesn't correspond with everything that I've actually heard about the bill. One of her major statements on this. What did I do with it? Somewhere around here, I printed off. Oh, here she is. She comes out and says, the bill is a step too far. All right. What's the step that we took that was too far? All right. And her response is, it's expansive, a step too far, and has unprecedented legislation that would put Arizonans at the center of a housing reform experiment with unclear outcomes. Okay, did not know Katie Hobbs was a conservative and did not believe in pro progressive growth. Anyways, so unfortunately, this expansive bill is a step too far, and I know we can strike a better balance. All right, she, all right. When somebody keeps using the term step too far, all right, that's like a buzzword, so I don't have an excuse, but I'm just going to say unprecedented. You know, in these unprecedented times, we need unprecedented solutions, but not solutions that will create unprecedented tax burdens on unprecedented amounts of Arizonans. Now, did I actually say something? No, not really. But I scared the hell out of you, didn't I? So let's talk Let's talk more about these unprecedented legislations and expansive bills that are a step too far. Right. Now, she wrote that the bill has unexplored, unintended consequences that are great concern, stating that Department of Defense officials, I'll get back to that one, contacted her office to express opposition over concerns of increased housing density near military installations and its potential impact on safety. She also wrote that firefighters expressed public safety concerns over increased density without corresponding improvements to roads and public infrastructure and its potential for traffic jams during evacuations or delays in emergency response times. While this expansive proposal is not the right step for our state, I believe that there is great promise in other legislative efforts to build more attainable housing. Right. Ortiz, one of the sponsors, comes back and this was a historic bipartisan solution to our state housing crisis and would have created a pathway to the American dream of home ownership that too many Americans find themselves locked out of. So, <clears throat> let's, let's take it to the top. Department of Defense. This is a well-known problem that the Department of Defense has. That they build their air base out in the middle of nowhere. They build their military infrastructure and installations out in the middle of nowhere. Why? Because they don't want an air and artillery shell blowing up a subdivision. And then they start encroaching closer and closer and farther and farther in to the military base. And sooner or later, locals who have moved into their new house suddenly get woken up at three o'clock in the morning because the local fighter wing is doing night training operations that day and everybody loses their minds and they start calling their congress how dare the air force fly at three o'clock in the morning why can't they work nine to five like everybody else does 
there's a military joke right there, but I'm too uh, too above these things to make that joke. Anyways, so the locals start complaining about the noise. Let's say you move in there and you got nice P-51 Mustangs flying overhead and they make that little <laughs> sound as they go, gives you a warm, fuzzy glow. Fast forward 50 years and now you got F-35s that are coming across the top and all you hear is <laughs> You're going to have a problem with that, okay? I know this because my dad complains. Hi, Dad. And yes, I can hear it too. It's not just you. So, yeah, certain planes are a lot louder than others. So the locals start complaining. Next thing you know, congressmen start complaining. And next thing you know, your base gets shut down on the next calling of military bases. One of the interesting things about military bases, we're out of space we can't make anymore. All right, if you were to try to start a, like, build a new Luke Air Force Base anywhere. Where do you find the land? How do you get the permitting? Know full well that Greenpeace is going to come up out of the woodwork and start protesting against it. The Chinese will find one guy living in a trailer within 20 miles of that to sponsor to start coming up with a reason why we can't have a military base there. So military bases are an endangered species, right? They, they keep getting winked out. We don't get any new ones. We don't have any more space to it. It's not World War II where most of these bases were founded at, where we can just, hey, it's for national defense, and we're just going to take over, you know, basically surprise, you know, Arizona and build an Air Force base out there. We also had Falcon Field. There's about four or five different airports that used to be here in the area that was just for flight training out of Luke Air Force Base. So that's, that's the DOD's concern. Something like this means you could have more housing. And we're talking people housing in the flight area of Luke Air Force Base. Sooner or later, somebody's going to have a problem with that, and they're going to try to shut down Luke. That, and if an F-35 decides to plow into Sunnydale Farms, you know, estates out there, you, you literally have more people on the ground per square meter to hit. So that's that's a justifiable logical issue. Um, the other one with the fire department thing is, I believe... Fire departments sort of are calculated per household, right? If you have a fire for every thousand houses per day, making numbers up to do the math easy, you have a thousand houses, one of those houses per day is going to have a fire in it. Joey playing with matches, grease fire, whatever the issue. All right, so you have one fire truck to respond to that one fire a day. Because remember, they don't just show up and put the fire out. They have to sit there to clean up this and that and the other thing. You, st you take that same amount of space and you suddenly put 5,000 houses in it. Well, now you need five fire departments. All right, so I can see where the fire departments would have a complaint with this. The one thing that this article does not cover all right, is the municipalities that came up to Governor Hobbs and said, we don't want this change. All right. What were those municipalities? I have heard. Paradise Valley, Scottsdale, right. Chandler, Awatuki, um, some of the ritzier places. Because what would happen if they no longer get to zone their McMansions? Next thing you know, you have people who don't live in McMansions in your neighborhoods. Those people... My God, you could have a, a single wide trailer suddenly pop up next to your McMansion and you'd have to walk on by it every day down to your Pilates class. Those people might have children who'd be interacting with your children, bringing their poverty with them. Oh, no, we can't have this. Quick, get Katie on the phone. Tell her to veto this thing. So. I might be being a little hyperbolic on that, and Lord knows I don't act. This is just my theory. Like I said, I've just heard that these were the cities that were complaining to Katie, going, hey, this bill needs to die horribly. And I'm pretty sure if I was to sit there and pull up all the Congress critters who voted for it, you would find the Congress critters who voted against it were probably from the more Tony places in Arizona, all right, as opposed to the more blue collary places you know it's like that whole hoa uh thing with uh oh you can't have a service truck after five o'clock in our hoa and it's written to be like oh no we don't want you having the help come what they really want is they don't want any nasty blue collar people with they come home they smell funny you know they probably ride motorcycles or have bass boats 
We don't have bass boats. We have sailboats, and we go sailing. You know, occasionally with our friends when we fly out to Catalina Island. Okay, we don't want anybody with a Bass Buggy 2000 Jethro Redneck up there playing Sweet Home Alabama. No, we're, we're much better than that. So that's my personal theory about why Katie Hobbs got a call from her handlers and was told to veto this bill. Just my personal opinion, not the opinions of ProStar Realty, the Arizona Association of Realtors, the National Association of Realtors, or anybody else. This is on me. All right. So, it will be a lot of fun to see how that goes. It would be interesting to see if they got enough votes to overturn that little bill and overturn that veto. I would love to see that. So, what's the F-bomb count? I think I pulled that off, didn't I? Hey. All right. Second one. The one everybody blew up my phone about. All right. I actually did record a video on this on my phone and I posted it up to Facebook simply because I had so many people sending in this. I just had to get the word out. Okay, guys, I'm aware of this and this is my response. All right. Um, at a point, a point I recorded, it's like, hey, I could just throw this on Thursday's podcast, but you know, that's going to require technology and I've got more information to talk about. So on Friday, National Association of Realtors forwarded a settlement for their legal kerfluffles they've been having about the commission lawsuits. And for you, those those of you who have been following my podcast or following the news or suddenly realize this because you read a CNN article, um, National Association of Realtors and various large brokerages were being sued because for um, under the Sherman Antitrust Act because they saying that all the real estate agents had gotten together were in collusions to defraud the consumer both buyers and sellers. Sellers were being defrauded because they were being forced to pay for the buyer's agents and the buyers were being defrauded. But because those buyer's agents were getting paid, the sellers had to sell the houses for more than the seller normally would have sold the house for. But the seller had to factor in their costs. This created increased housing costs and was detrimental to everybody. That's the lawsuit. I think I did a pretty good job of steel manning that without too much snark. NARS defense, if they had one, was inadequate. A jury of six. I think only one of them actually has owned a house their entire life. So there's an old saying, okay, um, court cases are won in jury selection. And this might be the classic textbook example that they'll use for the rest of their lives. All right. Six people have never bought or sold a house, or at least one of them has, decided that to find on behalf of the plaintiffs, you're right, this system is wrong. And NAR and all these other organizations colluded to defraud the, the consumer, and they found for the plaintiff. And it was a big, big, big uh, settlement, or a big charge. They were They were potentially on the hook for like four $5.4 billion or something that they've negotiated down. Well, and since then, it's like, hey, do they want to appeal? Well, you know, if you're going to appeal this thing, you actually have to post a bond for the full potential amount before you have the right to appeal, which I find is fascinating. Um, the how would we get overturned, this and that and the other thing, and then they just decided to settle it. Like, let's just kill this thing and get with it. So the highlights of what the settlement offers, all right, there is going to be a cash payment out, all right, that's the first one. The second one and the bit more big ticket items that we're concerned about is the part of the settlement is for a real estate agent to show you a buyer house. The real estate agent will be required to have you sign a buyer broker agreement. This is fascinating. All right, that's actually almost like a poison pill from NAR going in there. Because what this does for you, the consumer, is you don't get to use a real estate agent to show you pretty kitchens and then suddenly ghost them and call your sister up and have her write the contract. That's, I'm on board with that. You guys know me and Steve here at ProStar have been pushing this on our agents to no little pushback too. Let me tell you what. Um, to everybody needs to be signing a buyer broker. NAR just made it official. All right. Sellers, you are not going to be exposed to random looky loos who are going to come in your house just to look at your house, who happens to have a friend. 
who's going to show them the pretty kitchens. All right? <clears throat> so there's that. I actually think that's a pretty beneficial thing for it all about. Two, the seller is n no longer, the seller's agent is no longer going to be responsible, all right, to share any portion of their commission or offer compensation to a buyer's broker who shows up with a ready, willing, and able client who eventually closes on it. We've killed cooperation. So what this what this means to you, the consumer, depending on which side of the aisle you're on, right? If you are a seller, right? Now that when you negotiate your um, contract with your listing agent, you are going to be just negotiating for that seller's agent, right? Your your agent and what they're getting paid, and that a agent is no longer to begin negotiating for their cost of what they'd have to pay the buyer's side. Remember, this is the, and this is what got me going on this CNN article, all right? <clears throat> I never really trusted CNN for accuracy in their news. I don't know anybody who does anymore. Um, honestly, I can play that to most of modern media right now. Um, the the Manhoff amnesia effect is really, really big in the last 10 years, 15 years when it comes to media. Right? That's where, you know... Um, for you guys who forgot, that's where you're sitting there and you're reading the newspaper and you read an article that has something to do with your industry or your life and you suddenly realize how wrong that article is. It's like, wait a minute, I'm reading this article about my business and how my business was broken into yesterday and I'm reading the news about that and the article's completely wrong. And you go, wow, this new paper is completely wrong. And then you turn the page and you completely believe what they're telling you about something you have no personal knowledge of. Right, that's the amnesia effect, right? So in this particular case, this is my amnesia effect. Headlines for the CNN article was the 6% commission, 6 commission on buying or selling a home is gone after Realtors Association agrees to seismic settlement. The 6% commission has been dead and gone forever. It never existed. It was a fantasy. It's a unicorn. It's Sasquatch. It's Nessie. It's Mothman. It's the Jersey Devil. All right. That number has always been negotiable. That is not an industry standard. It was never set as an industry standard. You did have individual brokerages that leaned on public knowledge that thought 6% was the norm, right? And would return during negotiations back to that. You had consumers who just naturally thought it was 6%, right? And did that split and didn't think a thing of it. It was never a thing. Have I been clear enough for you? Why the attorney for the National Association of Realtors could not say this in court is beyond me. Now, absence of evidence is not evidence, evidence of absence. That does not mean it wasn't said and it was not reported to me through channels. Okay, hopefully they did, but apparently six people did not buy that. All right. They everything in real estate is negotiable your commission split from your what you're getting from your seller has always been negotiable we have lines on that on the contract going back i don't know when it's always been there right there you know commissions are negotiable between seller and seller's agent All right but nobody reads these things right. so anyways <clears throat> but they're seeing an off the top rope and i'm using that phrase a lot today just getting it wrong from the get-go I've had podcasts that I truly, truly, you know, respect and admire these podcasters say that. And I just want to, like, Sarah, you're breaking my heart over here. All right. So anyways, that's where it is. 6%, da-da-da-da-da. We don't have to worry about that anymore. What's going to happen is you're, I'm going to list your house. I'm going to list your house. And we're going to negotiate when I'm getting paid to list your house. And I'm going to tell you everything that I do to list your house. And if you sit there and say to yourself, you know, I don't want to pay that much. We're going to pull out the big, what I call the menu. And we're going to figure out what you don't, the services you don't want. 
All right. Okay. So da 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 da. How about just one open house first weekend of the month? I won't do an open house every weekend. Oh no, but I want the open house. How do I know you're not listening to Ray Dawson's uh, real estate podcast? Because you'll know what I said a billion times about open house. So that's not a loss to me. All right, honestly. But yeah, all right. We'll get rid of the open houses. Uh, we'll go to black and white flyers. We won't use the full color flyers. I will only advertise it on the MLS and a sign up in the front. I will not promote it on Facebook or any other social media. All right. So now we're talking about the silver package. Do you still want the professional photos? That's going to be run me a chunk of change, whether or not you accept an offer or not. That's what I have considered a sunk cost up till now. Now we have to figure out how to bill you for that. Or sign here. So that's that's what we're going at. And <clears throat> what I find is interesting is I find a lot of um, commenters on this thing talking about this is great. Now sellers get to negotiate with their agent. When you always could. All right. And two... Now you get to negotiate with people whose job it is to negotiate. This is the same reason why I like FISBOs for sale by owner. Let's go buy a house from a guy who thinks he can represent himself as a real estate agent. And by the time it's all said and done, not only have I got you the house, the hot tub, the car in the garage, but you have an option on his, on his daughter and we'll decide to exercise that option on his daughter when she turns 18. Okay. This is what we do people. All right. But, According to CNN, now you have the opportunity to negotiate. All right. So, and that's pretty much, all, all silliness aside, that's pretty much going to be what we're going to be looking at. For sale by owner, always could have sold your house by yourself. Go get the sign down at Home Depot, put it up in the front yard, put your phone number at the bottom of it, start getting a lot of phone calls. People knock on your door, can I see the house? Show them the house. All right. Want to decide you want to sell the house? You do these people right there, wander yourself down to an escrow company, say, I'm going to sell them the house. They're going to ask you a lot of questions about things you don't even know. And then you sell them the house. <clears throat> Six months later, they sue your ass. Okay. But you didn't want to know about the things that were going to get you sued because you knew enough to sell your own house. Number two, you decide you really want to be on the MLS. All right. You want to be, have that push through to Zillow and all those other places. So you find one of these discount brokerages that only market on MLS. They don't do anything else. They're not going to do anything to sell your house. They're going to put a sign up, all right? And they're going to put you on MLS. And on the MLS listing, it's going to be call owner. Talk to owner. Send offer to owner. Do not contact the listing agent for anything. Run you about $750, all right? That is pretty much for sale by owner, except you have MLS access. All right. And then we're going to have various new discounts, you, you know, brokerages and all the way up. And what's going to happen is like some people who have very calm, cool, tranquil transactions and they're ha they don't need any staging advice. They don't need any negotiation advice. They don't need any, should I replace this? Should I fix this? Should I get rid of this? You know, nothing. They don't need any professional advertising. They're going to find themselves a discount lister and they're going to list with a discount brokerage. That's, that's great. Okay. Those brokerages have always been there and those brokerages are thinking they're going to make bank right now. Uh, <clears throat> particular brokerage out there who made their bones, uh, saying that they'd sell your house in three days. And then they had to start saying, you know, a certain amount of hours. And then they started talking about, well, we're only going to market it for a certain amount of hours. It's not like you're going to suddenly get an offer that you're going to accept within 72 hours of signing the paperwork with those guys. I find it really interesting that it, it sounds like the founder of that thing just sold out and is getting out of Dodge. He's also named in the lawsuit, <clears throat> the Arizona lawsuit. But, all right, those guys, okay, they've always been out there, all right? So you've always had this multiple tier. So from a listing standpoint, I don't see any changes on my part, okay? The way I do business, the way ProStar do but does business. We're still going to have the thing. If you are not willing to pay my minimum, I'm going to direct you to another brokerage. And that's just all there is to it. Um, and that's served me very well in the past because, you know, to be completely honest with you guys, the guy who's really, really arguing about a half percent difference is going to be the guy who's probably going to wind up canceling or expiring your listing. 
and making your numbers look bad. 80% of all listings last year all right, were successful listings. That's four out of five houses that hit the MLS actually closed. The other 20% either expired or canceled. Canceled because the buyer, you know, seller decided he didn't want to do it anymore. Expired because it stayed on the market and nobody wanted to buy that place at that market. All right, cool. The So no change on that side. On the buyer side, all right, you the first time home buyer, I am sorry, guys. I am sorry. I tried to get you to write your congressman. I tried to get you to talk to your parents. I tried to get you guys to, I don't know, turn off your tickety talks and your Twittery stuff and da 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 and eat me some, you know, you know, ch chocolate pudding. And I don't know why I'm channeling Bill Cosby all of a sudden because that's not a good person to channel. But, um, first time home buyers. This, these are the people who are, are the big losers in this. All right, now hear my argument out. It's not real estate agents. All right, we're, we're going to survive. A lot of part-time agents. Bye. Two episodes ago, get out. Okay, same thing. This will just kick them out the door faster. All right. <clears throat> First time home buyers, you're signing a buyer broker. You're going to have to come up with some way to compensate your broker, your agent, to help you in the process. That's a given. All right. You do not need... A real estate agent you have never needed a real estate agent you can call the number on the sign you can try to get hold of the person on the other side one of the reasons why I got in real estate is because when I was trying to buy a house for investment nobody answered their damn phone I was like I know how to work a phone I could look I can push a button and next thing you know I'm talking to a stranger on the other side I can even set this phone up so it flashes at me in case I can't hear it because my music's too loud and I can answer a phone it's part of the secret to my success is I know how to answer phones all right but you can call those signs and you can say I want to see this house and they can show you that house and you can say I want to buy this house and they're gonna have you sign a paper called a limited representation and that agent is going to explain to you that they're not working for you all right because you don't have anybody working for you you're alone in the universe and that's how that one's going to be so if you're really lucky you're going to have a relatively ethical agent on the other side who's working for the seller who when they're going to have to sign a piece of paper that says I realize I, I do not have a real estate agent in this transaction or I realize that the real estate agent in this transaction is working for the transaction and is not working for me specifically so you can go that route. A good ethical one in that situation is just going to be putting documents in front of you. Hey, you need to contact a home inspector. Here's three to choose from. You figure out which one you want to do. You figure out which one you want to order. You meet the home inspector at the property. All right. And that home inspector will tell you what they see. You then decide looking at that home inspection, whether or not this house is worth it, whether this house is not, whether what item on there is a big ticket item that you need to fix or get fixed. All right. You get to figure that out on your own now because you don't have a real estate agent advising you on that. When that house appraises weird, you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do when that house appraises weird. You're going to have to figure out how to dispute an appraisal. That's bad. You're going to figure out how to recognize that an appraisal is bad and that there actually is an argument to attack that appraisal. I get it overturned. All right. You get to do that yourself now. Right. Um, not that that happens on every transaction, but we literally had a class on Monday on that or Tuesday with my, with my newbies and we went through appraisals and I picked an appraisal out that I had and we went it over and I said, these are your lines of attack on this. If you wanted to go to the appraiser and try to get it, you know, re just reviewed is usually the nice term we use at it. Reviewed is a um, very polite way of saying, listen, dumbass. You need to justify to me why you decided to go three miles away and find a house that was built 10 years earlier and drag it into my appraisal and use that as comp on my property. All right. See, I can be polite. We use the term reviewed. So, so as a first time buyer and you, you know, without an agent and stuff like that, if you can't afford one, right. And see, that's the other thing. Uh, you've already needed to come up with a down payment. All right, there's down payment assistance, right? But you still need to come up with the appraisal money yourself out of pocket. You still need to come up with your home inspection yourself. You can't finance either one of those two things. Although technically you can put home appraisers on credit cards and that's financing. All right. 
um, closing costs, everything else. Here's the thing. With various lenders out there, various lending institutions, depending on your loan, there is a cap of how much outside money contribution can go to your expenses. All right. They're called the ICPs. Hold on, I get that over here. In this, NAR put out a 45-page questionnaire answering questions. All right. This is, this is um, interested party contributions, IPCs. Okay, Interested party contribution is anybody paying for the buyer's cost. That's not the buyer. All right. And each one of these loans would have a cap. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac would say like 6% math. You can't go above 6% any kind of contributions. Sometimes you see a seller contribution to buyer closing costs. All right. And, but these loans would have caps on it. All right. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and the FHA really quick because they saw this was happening, came up and said a seller contribution to buyer's closing costs. Any compensation to the buyer's closing costs that go to the real estate agent, which is now a buyer's closing cost, it's not a seller's closing cost anymore, that's on your side of the ledger, is not going to be counted against the cap. That's huge. That is seriously huge, people. Right? Because without that, you, even if you got 3% closing costs from the seller, right, and you, had, you were working for a buyer's agent that was charging you 3, you were capped at 6. So if something came up like home repairs that your agent told you, hey, we need to get this resolved, and the selling agent came back on the other side and said, hey, we're willing to offer an additional 1% towards your closing costs, which is really the way you want to do it for various reasons that we'll discuss one of these days, um, you suddenly couldn't do that. You were capped out on that. So best you could do is a price drop. Problem with a price drop is since you're financing the bulk of your purchase, you're not actually saving enough money to replace the hot water heater. If we drop you the price of one hot water heater replacement, we're literally probably saving what, about 75 cents a month on your mortgage payment. It's going to take a lot of time to save up 75 cents a month before you can actually buy the hot water heater. That's why you always want to do a closing cost adjustment. Anyways, so that's what we got going on that the buyers in that position, you now start have to start figuring out how are you going to pay for this? Oh, by the way, if you were a veteran, thank you for your service. Your VA loan, gone. And yes, the veterans know about this, by the way. Well, at least the Veterans Association of Real Estate Professionals knows about this. And we are on the phone with the VA. The VA is moving at the speed of bureaucracy, but they have about, what is it, 96, 95 days now to come up with some guideline on this? Because as the rule is stated so far, the veteran using a VA loan cannot in any way, shape, or form pay for their real estate agent out of any source of funds. They are forbidden to do that. This is the way it's been. This is one of those rules that they wrote back way back in the day, protect the veteran, okay, from evil real estate agents who are going to overcharge them. And I can see the rationale why. And, but now with this new change, now that bureaucracy being the Veterans Administration now needs to change as quick as Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA just did. I expect to see something next week or two on that. All right, but in the meantime, it's a really good time to get, get cranky at the VFW. And there's a lot of vets getting cranky at the VFW about this. At least once I'm done talking to them. <laughs> so that's what we're going to see on the buyer side. Um, first time home buyers, you need to come up with more money. Second time, you usually got the equity from your, your previous um, home. And you're just rolling that forward. So you get, you tend to be a little bit more cash in hand. All right. But first time home buyers. So what are we, what's going to happen with the market? Market between these two things is you have, you're going to see buyers agents try the discount route. And what that is, is they're going to start working less and less and less and trying to go, well, I will do it for a flat fee. And they're going to have to work out their own metrics on what they can work with a flat fee for with their success rate, all right? And they need to start looking at their metrics on this, all right? Um, you see on the listings, we just mentioned earlier, a listing has an 80% success rate right now in this market. Traditionally, it's 70%. You get to a bad market, you know, like, you know, like last year, 
right? Right after the interest rate spike all happened, we were running about 65% success rate on that. All right. Um, buyer side, I don't have those numbers, but I figure they're probably worse than that. All right. Sort of based on my own experience. Um, you you will have buyers out there who have a time frame and they want a special house. It's like we need to renew our lease in four months. We want a special kind of house in a special price point in a special neighborhood. Or I only want to live in Mesa, and I don't want to live anywhere else but Mesa, and it needs to be north of the 60, south of the 202, from Val Vista to the 202, in that block. I don't want to live anywhere else, and it needs to be under 300,000. And there's five of them in there. And you go the first weekend out, and you look at all five, and none of them fit. Next weekend, three of those got off the market, but another three come on, so you're out there looking at the next three, and so on and so forth. And they never liked the house. There's always something wrong with it. And then all of a sudden they give you that glorious call one day and say, hey, we just renewed our lease. Thanks a lot. We'll get hold of you next year. So you've just lost however many weekends. Because right? remember, we're talking opportunity costs here. All right? There's only so many buyers an individual agent can work at any one time without seriously impacting the quality of service you're giving to your buyer. I got a buyer who can show on Saturdays. I can give them all of Saturday. All right. I can give a buyer on Sunday all of Sunday. I actually think I can handle about two buyers at the same time. I can handle three if the third one is works weekends and, and is available during weekdays. And we can work that around and show houses on weekdays, which is my favorite time to look at houses. Um, or something along the lines, but you really can't go... I'm going to meet you at nine o'clock, show you X amount of houses till noon. And then I have to leave and go meet my next client at one o'clock and show them houses. Cause what happens if you want to make an offer? All right. You're the morning crew and you want to make an offer right away. All right. What happens if it's Sunday and there's a five o'clock deadline on the house that you want to make an offer? At? What do I do? Do I call my afternoon client and say, Hey, I can't meet with you today. I got to write an offer with my morning client. Right. So like I said, there, there, there were limitations that and at a certain point you keep doing stuff like that. You're going to wind up divorced. And now you have to at least double your income to make up for what she's been doing, augmenting, paying your mortgage for you. Bad times, boys and girls, bad times. All right. So there's only going to be so many. So that means you're going to have to really, really cherry pick your buyers. All right. If and at a certain point, remember, it's economics. Not only do I have to price in the time and effort that I do working for you, buyer. I have to price in a percentage of spoilage of the time I invest with other buyers who never close. I don't think a lot of real estate agents have thought about this yet. I think a lot of real estate agents are going to discount themselves out. They're going to fight for the bargain bin in the basement. And they're going to really, really wind up taking a hit when they suddenly, when they suddenly realize that, oh my God, she didn't close. I've just spent all this time and effort with this one person right here. I gave her every Saturday for the last three months. And then she met a guy and decided to move to Prescott. And now I've just lost potential three months, a quarter of my earning potential. And if you're working two buyers at the time, that's a sixth of your entire annual earning potential. You just wasted on somebody who just left. So you need to start calculating that in guys. You need to start working that math in your head. Now, this could just be Ray being Ray, all right? You know, there are many times I said, hey, guys, this is a problem. And everybody looks at me and goes, no, this isn't a problem. You know, we'll be fine. Ah, that's fine. I don't want it to be grand. All right. And then next thing you know, it's not grand. All right. I do know there are other agents out there having these conversations. I do know other agents are out there. And so people who want to go to the discount route, I'm happy to see them do it. They're going to die horrible, bloody deaths, but they're out of my industry and they're no longer my competition. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to sit there and say, how low are we going to go? All right. I still like the idea of a retainer, all right, which you do not call it a retainer. It's a retainer on the form because it acts like and is a retainer, but it's more of a deposit on their future costs. Get them a little skin in the game. Right. We'll be looking at that and I'll still be showing houses and I'll still be negotiating contracts. And I will still be staring at the roof when you're still staring at the tile on the floor. 
All right. And I'll still be getting, you know, getting closings and I'll still be helping you achieve your home dreams. It is going to be a lot less real estate agents out there on the buyer side. It's going to cost you more. All right. On the seller side, I haven't thought that far ahead on this. All right. I do know that I will guarantee you if I was to go to the MLS right now and look at, do a search, I would not find one house that dropped their price 3% since last Friday with the words price reduced 3% because I'm no longer paying my agent to pay the buyer's agent. In fact, we had two calls into the house Saturday. They wanted to drop the, the uh, that right away. And when asked, do you want us to drop the sales price too? Oh no, I don't want us to drop the sales price. No, not at all. I just want more money. Right. That's the funny thing about the whole thing. It's the market, okay? Markets are weird that way, okay? We just lowered seller's costs. Yay team, that does not necessarily translate into a reduction in buyer's cost when you have a limited resource like housing. We have a dearth of housing, all right? We have a demand supply issue right now. We have reduced supply from where we should be. That's why our Crawford report number is still showing 114. If the Crawford report number was down at about 80, now we'd be talking about something. Now we'd be sitting there looking at, wow, we got so much supply on the market. Buyers, sellers need to reduce their price or start offering more concessions. And then the buyers benefit. We haven't had that since 2014, boys and girls. And this whole lawsuit, this whole thing is going to do nothing about that. And what would have done something about that got vetoed by Katie Hobbs. All right. My God, I haven't talked this long in a while. We were coming up on 51 minutes and 36 seconds. And I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. Like I said, um, you guys are looking for me. I will always be out there at some bar ranting to myself in the corner. I want you guys you know, to have a really good weekend. Watch your children, pets around water. It's starting to get warmed up out there. Do not drive in anything flooded. Work your circles, boys and girls, and have a great weekend. And if you know anybody out there who happens to be a licensed fiduciary, I have a client for them. Not me, but a client of mine. All right, you guys have a great weekend. I'll talk to you guys later.